Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you today. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm very honored um, to be delivering this talk uh, to a, one of the greatest universities in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, I need to mute something over here. Um, just uh, let me mute. All right. So if you hear me, please do um, send in a text message on uh, YouTube and I can see a few messages now popping up. That's really great. So let's go ahead and get the story started. Uh, today's talk is a, uh, a story about something that happened um, to my research group and a colleague of mine uh, in the early, early in the pandemic last year. And uh, on, it was about uh, June at the time. And again, my clicker is not working. Okay. Um, before I get started, I want to thank my team, however, and the funding sources. So funding was um, obtained from the Salt Lake County, the Utah Symphony, um, some support from the Center for High Performance Computing. You're going to see we're going to talk a lot about high performance computing that made this possible, and the Chemical Engineering Department. And this is the team that worked on this project. I have my student, um, Hayden Hedworth. He's a PhD student. Um, and uh, Dr. Josh McConnell, he's a postdoc in our group. Professor James Sutherland, my collaborator and colleague, myself here, and uh, Mokbel Karam, another PhD student of mine uh, from Notre Dame uh, University. Um, I recruited him from there a few years ago. Um, so this entire team made this possible, and this is the story of how we made this possible, and I'll tell you what we made possible also in a minute. So on June 23rd at 10 a.m., we received, um, James and I, we received an email from um, this person called uh, David Pershing. Okay, so David Pershing it was the former president of the University of Utah. He had just um, re stepped down as president and uh, he joined our department. He's a chemical engineer, um, so he was part of our department. He sent us this email um, and telling us that the Utah Symphony um, uh, and Utah Opera, that's the symphony for the state of Utah. So each state has just like the Lebanese symphony. Um, so uh, the Utah symphony reached out to him because they know him personally. He's a um, great art connoisseur. He loves the arts, follows, su supports the arts. So they reached out to him uh, specifically through this person called um, Patricia Pat Richards. Um, she was the interim CEO of the Utah symphony and she reached out to him and she said, um, we need some help in trying to model the COVID dispersion or aerosol transport, whatever that means um, for the Utah Symphony, because they want it to get back to, um, uh, to the concert, to play, um, you know, because these musicians, um, apparently due to COVID, they had to shut down. And they're, if you're a musician, you really rely on live performances. And so uh, the music industry turns out to be one of the hardest hit um, due to the shutdown, okay? And so they wanted to see if they can safely get back to playing from rehearsing to actually playing actual concerts where they can refund their symphony, et cetera. And they needed some help to do that modeling and they needed the results by the first week of September. This is June now, you know, when someone reaches out to you, it's gonna take, if you're in the university system, probably take at least two to three weeks just to get the project um, up and running because we need to know what we're dealing with. We need to sort out all the contractual details and um, who's doing what and the plan of action, et cetera. So technically we barely had um, about eight weeks to get all the work done. Um, and it was a daunting experience as a daunting uh, type of work, um, just as, a, as I will show you in a few minutes. So um, we had just about 10 weeks, eight to 10 weeks to get this done. And to put things in context, um, um, our, uh, our approach to helping the Utah Symphony understand if they can perform safely is to model the COVID uh, transmission as the transport or the movement of respiratory droplets. So you have an instrumentalist playing like a nobo or a flute, for example, or a bassoon. They emit a lot of respiratory droplets. Those droplets, they break up as they go through the tube of the instrument, and then they are transported in the air by the ventilation system and they move around and they might infect everyone else. And so a plan of action was to model that using simulation. Um, and just to put things in context, each calculation consisted about, of about 15 million grid points. You know, 
to you that might seem a lot, not a lot, but this is kind of a big size calculation. It's not your uh, typical run of the mill engineering CFD calculation um, you know, using Fluent. Um, this is some serious ca calculation simulation work. Um, it took about five days on we were using about 1,200 CPUs to run these calculations. So, to, and still, it took about five days to finish. Um, then we had terabytes of data, actually terabytes of data generated by because for each grid point, you have to store the velocity components, you have to score, to store the properties of the respiratory droplets, and so that's a lot of numbers that we had to store for each second of the simulation. And you can imagine big data sets and analyzing big data sets was um, was also significant. If you've worked in simulation, you will know that one of the headaches of doing simulation work um, is actually the data analysis. So for example, it would take us one day to generate just a single time average. Okay, so that's a lot of work. Just, just to do the simulations would probably have taken us um, um, uh, just the 10 weeks to analyze the simulations would, ta would take longer, but we were able to pull it off. And so um, after we got the email, James and I sat down together, um, well, remotely because we, you know, uh, COVID stuff. And so we, we spoke um, and we thought like, are we out of our minds if we were to take this? Because that's, that's going to be a lot of work. We had to do a lot of um, crunch time, take all the students off their projects and have them focus on this. And um, in retrospect, I am so glad that we were. And so this is this advice to the students is that sometimes, you know, this project was a small project in the grand scheme of things. Um, the funding for it was really small potatoes, like we say here. It wasn't wasn't that much. It barely funded a week of our students' times. And but the rewards of it to help the community, to help um, the performing arts, to help the Utah Symphony, to do something um, um, uh, altruistic in a sense, um, that was the greatest reward that we got out of this, okay? Um, okay, so now we can, uh, now that we have the history um, aside, um, let's start thinking about how we're gonna model this. So in my initial conversation with James, we thought, okay, how can we model the virus? And we're not virologists, we're not epidemiologists, we understand math and engineering and all of that. We understand transport and fluid mechanics specifically. and. So we said, okay, how can we tie this to something that we do? So our bread and butter, our our khibzu uh, uh, like they say in Lebanon, our bread and butter was doing simulations, CFD calculations, okay? And how can we tie this in to our CFD work? So we said, okay, as far as we understand, a virus is a little um, RNA thing or like some uh, some uh, microorganism that to for it to be transported it needs to be stuck on something and typically that's a res respiratory droplet so that's why you know when one sneezes in your face or um, uh, you know coughs in your face you get infected if they are sick it's because these respiratory droplets that are emitted from your mouth Okay, they carry the virus, the virus tags on these respiratory droplets, and it floats around by the air, and then you inhale it, and then you get infected. Okay, um, For this particular case, we were not worried about surface contamination because uh, you know, they can um, sanitize that regularly, okay? And typically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an indirect transmission route because you have to touch the surface and then put your finger in your eye, maybe in your ears, in your nose or, or something. And so, um, you know, surface contamination was not a concern. And also string um, players such as, you know, violins and cellos, et cetera, were not of concern because those can wear masks. The primary concern were wind instruments. And in a typical arrangement for an orchestra, there's about 10 to 15 of those. And you cannot mask those because you will affect the acoustics. So imagine putting a mask at the end of a trumpet. You're going you're gonna, to um, um, destroy the entire orchestra by doing that. And so that was not an option. We wanted to still see in the presence of an unmasked trumpet or flute player or oboe player, what happens to the droplets that are emitted from the end piece of the instrument? So that's the that was the primary route, primary source, and primary route of transmission. And we were only concerned 
with what's happening on the stage. So if one of the flute players or the wind, wind instrument, any of the wind instrument players was infected, are they going to infect everyone else? We are not worried about the audience um, for many reasons. And I'll discuss those in a, a little bit later when I show you pictures of the stage. But they were going to build out the stage to move the audience further back. They were going to physically distance the audience quite a bit. And the ventilation system with the audience is very well designed. In a way, each person is sitting in a vertical funnel of air that comes in from the ceiling and is returned below them. So in a way, they have an air curtain around them preventing any significant exposure to respiratory droplets. And finally, doing the simulation for the entire um, um, hall um, becomes extremely expensive. So we are focused only on the stage. Okay, um, and. So like, like I just said, essentially, if we focus on the aerosolized respiratory droplets, now we have a mechanism, we have a way to tie this into CFD. So if you think of the respiratory droplet just as an aerosol, the virus is attached to that aerosol, and that aerosol moves with the air, then we can essentially model those aerosols, those respiratory droplets, just simply as a tracer. Think of it as smoke. I'll give you a little example over here, where I have a little piece of incense. This is a simulation from um, a 2D simulation in our code. Um, and I have a little fan over here. So imagine you have a little stick of incense or uh, you know, some, some source of smoke or respiratory droplets, and then the air is blowing everything with it, okay? Um, and you see this mechanism, very intuitive. So now we can tie this into CFD, which is what we do, computational fluid dynamics. Okay, so the limitations, I want to put the limitations out there before, um, uh, before we proceed and, and look at the fund results, is that we're not providing recommendations on whether you res they resume activities or not. All we can tell them is, Look, this is if you if you don't do anything, this is how much accumulation of respiratory droplets you're going to have. If you do the following things, then you're going to reduce that accumulation. And then, uh, you know, calculating the risk of infection is a difficult problem. Even epidemiologists have hundreds of models of those, and so we were not claiming any any knowledge of that. But with decent certainty, we can tell them, uh, you know, if you, the baseline performance, this is how much, if everyone is infected, this is how much accumulation you're going to have. And clearly, the more accumulation of respiratory droplets, the more likely you're going to be infected. By how much? We don't know. Okay, so you, we leave that um, uh, up to the epidemiologist to help the Utah Symphony make that decision. Okay, um, we did not consider droplet or aerosol size distribution. We assumed all the droplets are airborne; they're going to be transmitted. So, we, in, a, in a way, we took the worst case scenario. We also assumed that um, all the instrumentalists are infected and playing at the same time. Well, we really didn't assume they're infected. We just tracked the respiratory droplets that were emitted from wind instruments, but we assumed that they were all playing continuously at the same time. So again, that we took the worst case scenario. Why is that? Because if we can make the worst case scenario really effective, if we can fix the worst case scenario, in reality, things are going to be better because wind players are not going to be playing at the time, uh, all the time and at the same time. Okay, um, we did detailed information of emissions from individual instruments was not available. So, you know, we again tried to get the most recent data and just we picked kind of the worst case, like the maximum number of uh, clearly the number of droplets that you emit um, is based on the note you're playing, the strengths and the pitch and all of those things. And so we we looked at some literature and saw, for example, for the flute, they were playing different notes with different um, 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 speeds, etc. So we picked the worst case and we said that um, that's going to be our source because otherwise it's it becomes um, um, an impossible problem to solve and you're not going to gain that much insight into that. So we took the worst case scenario. Um, and like I said, we didn't consider the interaction between the stage and the and the um, the house. So the house is where the uh, audience sits. Um, a well-designed concert hall, apparently, actually separates the ventilation from the stage and the house. And this is exactly what, what we observed when we went and did measurements. When you measure along the curtain, when we measured along the curtain, there was pretty much no cross flow through that curtain. Okay. Um, for those who are in the FD, this is a slide about what we 
technically used in the in the in our code. Um, so we've been developing this code for like a thousand years. I started developing it when I joined the University of Utah in 2010 as a postdoc. And then um, between James and I, we made it, uh, you know, uh, more and more um, useful. And this was one of the most useful um, um, projects that helped fine tune our code. So anyway, we used large edge simulation, second and third order um, approximations. Uh, well, first and second order in time. Sometimes we used a third order um, uh, to, to handle some stability issues. Anyway, um, uh, you know, these are some of the assumptions. I'm not going to bore you with that. You can pause this, uh, the video over here and look through those. And if you have questions, you can um, email me later. Um, but anyway, so let's go and um, talk about the, what we actually did right now. So this, this is a picture of the concert hall that we were looking at. It's huge. It's huge. Look at how many people it is seating over here. This is the full orchestra. And this hall was named after Maurice de Abravanel. This guy was born in the Ottoman Empire. Like how many people do you know who were born in the Ottoman Empire? My grandma wa was born during the um, Ottoman rule, but like that's the, the only person I've known in my life who was born in the uh, Ottoman rule. So um, um, uh, very old man, okay? And he died in 1993, but he was the first conductor for the Utah Symphony, um, which was um, uh, incorporated in 1979 and bu built this hall, um, cost them at the time $12 million. So, you know, um, uh, probably would cost about $30 million if you translate, uh, calculate inflation rate today. So it's a beautiful and very big hall, um, accommodates a lot of people. You can look it up on Wikipedia. But after he passed away, they named the hall, it used to be called Concert Hall. Um, in Salt Lake City, and um, they now named it Abravanel. So that's um, that's the name of the guy. So we wanted to model this entire stage. Okay, that's what we're looking at. All right. So I show you some pictures now of my team. So this is um, I took this picture from the house, looking up at the stage. Um, this is Mokbel over here writing down some measurements, and this is James over and looking. We're looking up here. Um, those are return vents, and this is Hayden. If you um, if you cannot see him, he took that lift. It's a 32 foot lift. Um, so, you know, as high as a two-story um, um, building in, in Lebanon, okay? So these are inlet vents, but they're not continuous. Turns out there's an inlet vent, and then there's a gap. There's an inlet vent, and then there's a gap, and so on and so forth. Okay, these are important um, indications now because those are going to affect the simulations, okay? Um, there's a door over here. And there's a door over there. Those two doors are going to be very important, okay? And there are some return vents distributed along the sides and the back over here, okay? And again, those are very important to know, okay? Um, again, these are pictures of the team. Um, uh, that's me, fully masked with the face shields. They, the the uh, the Salt Lake County, they you know they asked us. Uh, if you want to go into any state building, etc., you have to be masked and so on. And so, um, you know, a team, a bunch of um, hot wire. Uh, Hayden here is holding a hot wire anemometer. And we also had an, a fan based anemometer as well to do the measurement. So, the reason we went down, we don't do experimental work. I mean, we, we even had to kind of Google and learn how, how to do these measurements. But um, uh, the, the problem was that. We were significantly actually de delayed because early on we hired a company, um, an HVAC company, the, the Salt Lake County actually asked for that, to hire an HVAC company to come and do measurements in the hall. And so it took them like two weeks to go and do measurements and they gave, they, we asked them to give us um, velocity distributions and pressure distributions so we can do some type of um, verification that we are kind of in the ballpark of at least what's going on over there. And after two weeks, they sent us this email and they said that the velocity is zero everywhere in the in the hall. And we're like, you know, that doesn't make sense at all. Like, uh, you know, in, in a ventilation system, yes, it's very low, you know, in, in, for comfort. You're talking about very low speeds, okay, on, on the order of, you know, 0.1 meter per second. But, uh, you know, it's not zero. And then they sent us an email and they said, oh, it's because of turbulence. So, you know, we rolled our eyes, rolled up our sleeves and actually went down and did the measurements ourselves. And that, but that delayed us about two, two and a half weeks. OK, um, this is a picture from what's what's on top of the vents. So if you look at the vents over here, we went up behind that and this is what you're looking at. So you see there is a main um, ventilation line that's coming here and you see how they resize the ducting. 
So <clears throat> mechanical engineers, you know why we do that. Okay, so every time there's a return, then because of the pressure drop, you gotta reduce the area so that you can continue with the same velocity. So um, you see how the um, air comes in, the, the venti ventilated air comes in, and then it is distributed to the stage. And you see the gap, so this is an inlet vent, and then there's a gap over here, and then there's an inlet vent and another gap. Um, this thing is a, um, there were, you see all of these wires coming down, there are thousands of them, and just walking around those, it's like a, a, a marionette's dream, all of these um, um, threaded wires, and we were walking on a, on a bridge um, that was just suspended by one of, by many of those wires, so, you know, I didn't want to spend any more than like two minutes up there. Um, um, anyway, it, it was a, a fun and terrifying experience at the same time. All right. So once once we got the measurements, et cetera, we had a plan for what we were going to do with the simulation. And initially, the orchestra gave us this arrangement, this socially distant arrangement. So um, just to kind of put things in perspective, you 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 would imagine that orchestra arrangements you know, they, they've they been in the works for centuries, right? To come up with the perfect orchestra arrangement and rules of thumb or how you arrange the orchestra for a particular hall with particular acoustics, where to put the strings, where to put the um, the winds and uh, wind instruments and so on, to put the percussions, etc. cetera. Um, so, so this arrangement, the socially distant arrangement of the traditional orchestra, it took also a long time just to come up, but uh, um, the conductor, you know, with his team, they were able to come up with a socially distant arrangement, but still they were worried about the wind instruments. But what you notice here is you got a bunch of um, string instruments up front, and then you have um, the bass over here, but then you got a, all, everything in color um, is a wind instrument, okay? So there's a lot of wind instruments in this arrangement, and you have the percussions in the back and then the piano over here, et cetera, okay? Uh, but all everywhere over here, you've got wind instruments, okay? Um, and we were able to get some data, like I said um, early on, like the worst case scenario um, in terms of concentration and volumetric flow rate. So what, you, what we are worried about now is there are two things that are gonna um, um, help us as we move forward. And there are two things to consider. There's the number of, um, um, particles that are being emitted by a player, by, in, by a wind instrument, and the speed at which those are being emitted. So if you emit a large number of respiratory droplets, we call you a super emitter. We came up with that uh, nomenclature just for the sake of uh, making sense of things. Um, if you emit at high speeds, so you shoot out your, your droplets further into the stage in space, we call you a super spreader, okay? So super emitter is a player that emits a large number of particles, um, potentially infected. A super spreader is one who emits those particles at high speed, so they have the potential to throw them at a distance. The combination of the two, a super emitter and a super spreader is a nightmare, right? Because you might be emitting, you can be a super spreader, but you might be emitting like one particle per liter. No, that's not much. You have less risk of, in fact, you, you're not going to infect a lot of people with that. It's a small viral dose, right? If you, you can be a super emitter, so you emit a large number of particles, like the bassoon, for example, but, you know, you're emitting them, or you're only infecting yourself, reinfecting yourself, essentially. You're not sending them out. Okay, it's the combination of the two that warrants particular attention. So with that in mind, um, what I did here is um, change the arrangement to reflect what I just said. So what you're looking at here are two scales. You have the size scale and the color scale. The size scale corresponds to super emitters. In other words, the larger you are, the more particles you are emitting. And that scale is shown over here. We start with the flute as the lowest, as the emitter of the lowest number of particles. The trumpet has the largest number of particles. Okay, so I translated particles per liter to particles per second using the volumetric flow rate. But you can see here the trumpet, for example, um, has a large number of particles, is emitting a large number of particles. Compare that to the flute. The flute, because the size is small, is emitting a small number of particles. Now look at the color. The more red you are, 
okay, the faster your jet speed at the outlet is, or the more of a super spreader you are. So look at the trumpet. The trumpet is red, so it's a, it shoots out really long at long distances. The flute as well, okay. But then look at the oboe. The oboe is in blue, so it's a it doesn't emit at very high speeds. The trombone doesn't emit at very high speeds at all, but it's very large in size. It is a super emitter, but not a super spreader. So it's just reinfecting itself. But the trumpet is one of the is the worst nightmare in this. The flute, on the other hand. It is in red, so it is a super spreader, but it's not a super emitter, okay? So, you know, keep that in mind. This is kind of the color and size map that we're going to use as we move forward. Okay, the first order of business was to do a simulation of the baseline configuration, that um, original arrangement that we had. Um, we run the simulation, we run the respiratory droplets, the tracers, what we call tracers, and see what happens, okay? So first things first, we're going to look at the velocity field. So what I'm showing here, or at the speed of the airflow, um, and this is a log scale, okay? So taking the logarithm, so, it, so they look a little bit um, um, uh, more dramatic, okay? Um, colors go from blue to red. Blue is um, low velocity, that's about 0 0.1 meter per second. And red is about 0 0.5 um, uh, meter per second. And max, the maximum velocity was 2.18 meters per second. That's coming in from the vents, okay? Now, this is our um, numerical um, representation of the domain. You see all the instrumentalists were represented as cylinders. Because we, we really didn't think that the, their, their body shapes matter at all because we're looking at the bulk properties of the flow, but we had to represent them um, to place them somewhere so that we know where to place um, the sources. So I'm gonna run this video now so that you look at what's happening in the airflow, okay? So you see the air is coming in from the top and now we are looking at the stage and I have three slices over here showing the speed or the velocity, okay, the speed of the air moving around. And you notice two things. You notice that um, if you start, if you look at this plane, you notice that there is a recirculation zone up front and the recirculation zone at the back. But then notice the corners over here, you see the spike and the velocity, that's where the return vent is, okay? So, and that's gonna be important because this return vent breaks that vortex in the back Okay, because it, it just breaks it. Okay, the vortex is trying to form and recirculate, but that return vent breaks it. That's a good thing, because if potentially you had any virus stuck in this recirculation, it's going to be um, removed by the return vent. However, out front, remember, there was little airflow between the stage and the house. So pretty much that curtain acts as a barrier for the flow. And indeed, we see the formation of a large vortex that will continue on recirculating over there. Um, this is a view from the front, and I took a cross section parallel to the curtain. Um, and you see how the air is very well mixed, you know, and it actually, it's actually very, very pleasant at the stage um, over there. So given the, um, how old the building is, this is amazing, okay? All right. These are some streamlines of um, what the flow looks like, okay, time average streamlines. And indeed, this confirms what we observed with the instantaneous um, uh, velocity that I just showed you. You have this kind of large recirculation out front um, over here, and then you have these two zones in the back, actually two counter, two um, uh, vortices rotating kind of perpendicular to the to the to the plane so this is just qualitative observation of what's going on and you have this dead zone in the middle okay so this is good nice interesting this is the baseline configuration of what happens now let's look at uh, the actual spread um, of respiratory droplets um, before i step out of the of the frame um, what you're looking at are emissions from each and every wind instrument, okay? So you see these initial conditions over here, this kind of little red blob. Okay, what you're looking at are contours of particle concentration or particles per liter going from 0.1 to 10. So 0.1 is gonna be in yellow. So any, any yellow spot you see, there's 0 0.1 particle per liter, whatever that means. In other words, every 10 liters, there's one particle. Every 10, 10 liters of yellow, there's one particle on average. Um, orange is one particle per liter and red is 10 particles per liter. You're gonna see the maximum here is about 2,500 
particles per liter. That's very, very close um, to um, to the instruments. Okay, um, to to the the mouth to the mouthpiece of the instrument. In other words, and notice here also um, you have two spots over here. This is the flute, because the flute as they're playing, they're they they're emitting close to the reed in their mouth, and they're emitting at the outlet at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna run this and let you observe it. Oops. Okay. So you see initially the flow is coming in and the instrumentalists are starting to emit things and then dilution and mixing occurs and you see the red turn into orange as it expands and propagates, right? So you're diluting the number of particles per liter and they continue moving around. So when we looked at this, this was very scary because that's the, in that worst case scenario, if everyone is emitting, you are spreading those emissions, those aerosols everywhere, okay? And we wanted something a little bit more quantitative to move forward because we, this was the first type of work with kind of uh, public health and viral transmission we do. So we came up with the following metric. We said, okay, what we are interested in is if an individual, if a player is going to be exposed to an actual, um, um, to, to, to a droplet. I don't care if, you know, two meters above me, there's a thousand viruses or a billion viruses. If they don't reach me, I don't care about those. Okay. So what we did, we took a plane from about chest level to just about um, just a few centimeters above, above the head and <clears throat> drew a plane along the entire stage. Um, with with this height, and we took a both a space average vertically and a time average over time, and we were able to create this map over here. Okay, so this map again shows the time average um, particle concentration. And to reorient you, this is the French horn over here, the trumpet, bassoon, clarinet, um, the flute, and the flautist or the flautist, and the oboe. Okay. Now notice the trumpet is both both a super emitter and super spreader. And notice, however, because of the presence of that vortex that is going to the back, um, the trumpet would have shot its um, its respiratory droplets all the way to the front because it's both a super emitter and a super spreader. However, that return vortex in the back it just carries all these particles and pushes them towards the poor um, um, percussions and the trombone. Now the trombone is is a super super emitter, but it's not a super spreader. So everything is stuck around the trombone, no issues. But the flute is a super spreader, not a super emitter yet. Just that little concentration in white is about one particle um, per liter. Okay, over here. Um, it is flooding. The entire strings assembly is being flooded, both from the flautist and the oboe. Bassoon and clarinet, they contribute a little bit, but these kind of are very scary over here. Okay. Um, the French horn, not that much. It's kind of doing its own thing in the back. So this was very informative. Okay. This was very informative, but this arrangement was not going to work. It's not safe. I, I wouldn't be comfortable walking on that stage if, if they're playing and someone is infected. Okay. So what do we do now? Um, I'm going to give you an analogy. We thought of that analogy a little bit later, but just to add some dramatization um, to the story, I'm going to do the car smoke analogy. And um, as, as Lebanese, you are now no stranger to, um, uh, to smoking. Okay. So suppose that you must transport an individual who is smoking a cigarette in your car. We've all had to do that. I had to do that with um, you know, grandparents and uncle and parents, etc., and friends. And so you know, but also assume that um, you really hate smoke, okay, cigarette smoke, but you have to transport that person. So what do you do? Okay, what do you do to minimize your exposure to the smoke and the smell of it and just, it, you know, stinking up your car? What do you do? So you open up the windows, right? Blast the AC, keep the car moving. If you don't have an AC, just open the windows, keep the car moving, okay? And you would potentially ask the smoker to sit as far back as possible and as close to a window as possible, okay? The reason is that you want to take out that 
infected air so think of the analogy now we're gonna analyze we're gonna make the energy between the smoke and the infected particles okay um, your goal is to push that infected air and bring in fresh air as fast as possible all right so with these two analogies we're gonna translate those to um, our situation opening up the windows blasting the ac and keeping the car moving is akin to modifying the ventilation. So essentially we would say, okay, can we open the doors, for example? Are there windows that we can open without affecting the acoustics? Can we throttle the return and push more air through the windows or through the stage or somewhere else? Modify the ventilation was option one. And more importantly, and we found that this is gonna have the most impact, is to modify the orchestral arrangement. Now imagine that a bunch of engineers who, um, so some of us are, Hayden, the PhD student, is a classical uh, musician. Um, my colleague James um, uh, uh, is a singer in the Tabernacle Choir. I play classical guitar. So we had our feet in classical music, more or less. But, you know, we're not in the classical music world. So imagine a bunch of engineers coming and telling Thierry Fisher, the current conductor of the Utah Symphony, telling them, we're going to rearrange your orchestra based on CFD simulations. But lo and behold, they were open to that, um, to that suggestion. And they told us we will do anything to keep our musicians safe. So we were blown away when we made that suggestion because we knew this is the way to go. Okay. And then we came up with the slogan, which was very useful as we you know when we were having some interviews, et cetera, with some public outreach and public attention, we started telling people, if you change the airflow, you change where the aerosols go. So this essentially ditches this idea of the six foot um, social distancing um, thing, which is, is a very old rule, um, which only talks about the satellite distance of large particles. But for aerosolized droplets, they can go, they can travel uh, uh, hundreds of meters, okay? So they can travel long distances, and especially if they don't evaporate, but they can keep on going, okay? So what matters more than the physical distancing is the direction of the airflow. Now, we ran a lot, of, a lot of scenario arrangements. Luckily, we had Hayden on board. He really knows his classical music. He helped us kind of figure out how to move the instruments around. We ran a few different um, HVAC configurations. Um, we opened the doors at 80%. So essentially, we changed the return to 80% and forced 20% of the air to go through the doors. We tried with 60%, didn't make any difference. I will only show you the relevant cases. But in total, we ran about 20 full simulations. Um, and we used more than 500,000 CPU hours. So that's the equivalent of 57 CPU years. What that means is that if you had one computer with one CPU and you were running our calculations nonstop, it would take that computer 57 years, okay, 57 human years to run all of these calculations. We did this in about, you know, five to six weeks with 500,000 CPUs. So that's the power of parallel computing. Okay, so I'll only, only talk about the two relevant cases that we ended up um, adopting. The first one, we kept the original seating arrangement because we wanted to minimize manipulating and changing the orchestra. Okay, so we said, okay, let's open the doors, change the return, etc. And let's see what happens. And this is what we did. So we notice here we had the open door, um, stage right and stuffed. Okay, so we opened the, um, the doors and let's see what happens. This is the baseline configuration with closed doors, just for you to compare. <clears throat> what you notice immediately is that, you know, there wasn't much difference and that's why we stopped the simulation early on, except for the area near the open doors. So what the open doors ended up doing, okay, and what I'm gonna show that here is that they ended up providing us with two very large return vents. And what I'm showing here in purple are the streamlines that are exclusive to the doors. Okay, in other words, the open doors, the reach of the open doors was to this extent, it was large compared to the to the to the stage. Okay, it was reasonably large, but it didn't affect instruments that much because most of them were away from it so over here you have the piano right it's not going to affect um, anyone that much okay the pianist is not you know he's masked etc so it's not a big deal um, and over here as well it only affected um, I think the bassoon okay so the doors had an effect 
but it was not sufficient because what we really need to reach, we really need, need to reach the trumpet and the flutes over here. So that's what led us to doing the re rearrangement. What I want you to look at here are these four regions, um, the eyebrows and the eyes, okay? These are the regions where we have access to a return or access to a region where we can flush out um, the infected air, okay? And these two, the eyes are caused through the, uh, looks like a Darth Vader thing, but looks, uh, these, these eyes, they are affected directly by the doors and the eyebrows are affected by the return vents, okay? So now we're gonna go and look at a modified seating arrangement. And that took a while, and we're gonna do this together. So this is the original arrangement. Again, think of size is large number of droplets. The larger the size, the larger the number of droplets. And the color, the more red, um, the faster the jet speed is, or the more of a spreader they are, okay? We're gonna superimpose this, figure, and you see that the doors only affected here the bassoon, but they didn't affect anyone over here. So we really didn't gain much from opening the doors with this arrangement, okay? So what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna move the percussions away. We're gonna start thinking about rearranging the orchestra in a way that doesn't affect the acoustics. This is where um, classical music knowledge comes in. So first, we're gonna move, we're gonna look at the trumpet and the trombone. What we did, we moved them to the back. Okay, let them stay over there. Okay, these are super emitters. The trumpets are super emitters and super spreaders. Let them stay over there. The trombone was happy over there. So we just kept them there close to the return vents. Next, we took the clarinets, which are also reasonable in, kind of in the intermediate range as super emitters and super spreaders. We put them all the way to the back. We moved the flutes into this region, still satisfying physical distancing, okay? There's still an average distance of six feet between a radius, a radial distance of six feet between all instruments, okay? So we put the flutes over here. The flutes are super spreaders, so they have large jet, jet speed. So we need a very kind of strong suction. So we put them close to the doors. We move the French horn over here, the oboes um, here. So the oboes are not super spreaders. They're okay emitters, but we put them close to the door. We actually took us a while to reach this arrangement. We had to run a few um, simulations for that. And now we have a new orchestra arrangement. Look at this, okay? All right, so now for the punchline. Let's see what happens. I don't have to tell you that this is significantly better, even just qualitatively. When we saw this, we, we all were cheering up. We had goosebumps uh, on our hands, you know, and some of some of those who had hair, they had goosebumps on their hair. I didn't get goosebumps because I have very little hair on my head, but uh, didn't get goosebumps on my head. But this was amazing. What we did, we ran the baseline calculation. Think of it. We modified, opened the doors, and then we rearranged the orchestra. And look at that. Now let's do something a little bit more qualitative. We do that spatial and time average. Look at this. Look at the difference. So if you take now, if you take the average number of particles between this one and that one, we were able to reduce the concentration by a factor of 100, okay, on average. This is amazing. So when we showed this to the orchestra, they, they were beyond joy. And the players, um, we actually met all of the players. We would meet with them regularly. And in the end, when we showed them this, they were thrilled. And so happy that they could be able, that they have an option to be able to come back and play, okay? Um, this is a more technical drawing of um, kind of how we calculated the particle concentration, etc. So, uh, you know, the baseline curve, what this is counting is um, the percentage of the breathing zone, um, how, the, the number of particles, how much they occupy, how much per volume they occupy in the breathing, breathing zone, I'm sorry. So in the red curve, that's the baseline. We saw, we see that. So what this is showing on the y-axis is the percentage of breathing zone, the volume that's occupied by a certain particle size, particle um, concentration, and on the x-axis is the log of the time average concentration. So over here you have um, essentially one particle per liter, ten particles per liter, and hundred particles per liter. And you will notice that most of the breathing zone. 75% and then 100% was occupied by larger 
by these larger particle sizes. What we did, we brought with this new configuration, we brought everything to the smaller particle concentration. Sorry, not particle sizes, particle concentration. Okay, so now the ultimate test is skin in the game. If you don't know um, about uh, Nassim Talib, um, he's a Lebanese American um, philosopher and um, uh, uh, mathematician, etc. cetera. Um, he's, a, he's an interesting guy to follow. Um, he has this uh, book called Skin in the Game, um, and it's not a new idea. It's essentially the litmus test or uh, walk the walk, talk the talk. So essentially the ultimate test is, are we comfortable Okay, are we comfortable um, um, in following our own recommendations? And this is the ultimate test. I'm gonna show you this ultimate test. So in other words, next time you go to the doctor and they recommend a surgery, for example, for your kid, tell them, would you do this surgery for your kid? And if they say yes, then you do it. Or you go with an investor, they recommend you do some particular um, investment, ask them if they have invested in that type of investment. Let me show you the ultimate test here. This is the first performance of the Utah Symphony um, after they were completely shut down. So this was in October. Okay, notice the open doors. So they invited us. We were among the first to come and see the performance. You see some in the audience out front and look at the open doors. And um, um, that also gave us goosebumps. We had a lot of goosebumps in this, in this project. Um, so uh, this was this fantastic, just seeing how our work was able to affect and, and have a great impact on, um, on, on uh, the local community. Okay, some of the conclusions, uh, we ended up doing the same analysis for another um, concert hall in Salt Lake City and you know, same story, we, we were obsessed with doors essentially. First thing, doors and windows, we were looking for doors and windows. Um, anyway, so we also did that and um, they ended up implementing, uh, implementing it as well. Um, the point I want to make here is when you think about pathogen dispersion, you have to think about fluid mechanics. You cannot focus only on the virology of it and say, you know, how much dose you've inhaled. That's important, but you also, you're not going to be exposed to, vi to the virus or the pathogen if it doesn't reach you, right? And the mechanism for it to reach you is for you to either, you know, put your hand on it and, you know, touch your mouth or for it to be brought by the air. Okay, so there's no other way. Okay, and um, at least for you know respiratory um, um, types of pathogens. So you cannot do it without understanding the fluid mechanics, and this is where CFD comes in. Um, it's an invaluable tool in this type of assessment. Okay, so it has to be included. I do not trust any analysis now that doesn't have a CFD calculation, and it has to be very specific to the venue. Um, we couldn't draw a rule of thumbs in general because you know I know people love rules of thumb, but uh, you know, this is going to be very specific to the individual HVAC system that you're dealing with. However, in general, you want to encourage air replacement as much as possible. So we're doing this in our house, for example. There's this thing um, called the whole house fan. You put it in the attic and it's like a huge fan creates this kind of negative pressure and brings in fresh air and moves all the air in your house in about five minutes. So you, you can uh, um, um, clean out the air instantly in, in your house. Um, you can apply things like that in, in, in a venue, for example. Place super spreaders closer to vents. Um, so that's like the flute and the trumpet. Um, we definitely need more high resolution calculations to develop low order models so that we can do simulations faster. Okay, we can do these simulations faster. Um, and you know, that analysis can be applied to offices and cubicles, clinics, hospitals, etc. cetera. We, we had a few other gigs on the side. Um, that we did with this, but this was a, a, a really, really fun project for this. Um, um, what I was going to show next is a more of a philosophical slide. I'm going to skip that. Um, this this was intended for a uh, more C CFD oriented audience, um, but because the audience is general, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, some of the other outcomes, we ended up sending a couple of proposals on the subject. Um, one of them was rejected. Another one is kind of still pending. Um, we had a few interviews here and there. So this was one of the many, many rewards of doing this work. If you are in, in my area, 
you rarely get that public exposure because we are in the nitty gritty details of algorithmic design and design and mathematical analysis. You don't touch on the uh, uh, public health issues or things related to the public directly. We had a few interviews here and there. One of them was with NPU Utah. That's like the that's the national public public radio in the U.S. is a one of the most respected, um, um, unbiased. Um, media uh, radios in 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 the U.S. and so we had an interview with them that was that was that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm hosting a mini symposium on CFD and COVID-19 um, at the AIAA 2021 CFD conference, and I'm also hosting an um, a special issue for CFD and COVID um, with the International Journal of Computational Fluid Dynamics, um, editor in chief Professor Wagdi Habashi uh, from Egypt. Um, um, I, I reached out to him and he was super excited about this. We have a few papers in there. If you know someone doing CFD and COVID, encourage them to send me a paper. Um, and again, I thank the entire team and the funding for this. And if you want to reach out to us, you can um, talk to James. This is his email. Or you can talk um, to me. Um, this is my email and my website, and you can find all of these videos on the YouTube channel, and I'll send you a link about this video. Um, and with this, we uh, I'll conclude the seminar. We can now switch back to WebEx and continue the discussion over there. I will record the WebEx discussion also on this YouTube, so you don't have to worry about that, but um, let's go jump in on WebEx and continue the discussion over there. Thank you so much for your attention. It was an honor, again, to be here with you today. Let me just uh, turn on the discussion video um, over here and make sure um, can capture this window. So we have first a question from uh, Ibrahim Badr. Just a second so that right, so we can uh, have a discussion now if you if you have questions, um, comments. Um, It'd be great to hear from you. Okay, so Ibrahim, whenever you want. All right, hello, Dr. Uh, the, the talk was very interesting. I wanted. All right, so I wanted to, to ask about uh, CFD analysis. Uh, there seems to be like an echo right now. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, is it possible to utilize GPUs? Uh, I cannot. 
Yes, Ibrahim, you have a question? I cannot hear you. We're not able to hear you very clearly. I do believe that you're asking if we are able to use GPUs. Uh, yes, doctor, is this better? Yes, Ibrahim. Can you all hear me? So if you want, you can send your question by chat. Hello. Ah, uh, the... Uh... Uh, doctor, doctor, is this better? Yes, uh, there was, that's much better. It, it was my bad. I opened YouTube at the same time, so I guess it no was problem. playing at the same time. So what I was asking, first of all, uh, wouldn't it be more efficient to utilize GP, uh, parallel GPUs instead of parallel CPUs in CFD analysis, as it seems to be more GPU bound than CPU bound? Um, so Nizar had a question, do the open doors affect the sound system? Uh, not really, because the, they might slightly, but we didn't see that when they were playing and they were happy with it because they're, the doors are large enough so that you don't have um, acoustic sound from the air hissing through. And that air goes through a very long hallway, so it has just enough time it's not exposed close to the highway, for example, or the streets or the noise from the streets. So, um, but the noise created by the air moving through the doors is is insignificant. We didn't even detect anything. Um, so, Mahmoud, um, uh, you guys can speak up if you want. Can you hear us, Dr. Saad? You don't have to follow me on YouTube right now. You follow me on WebEx. But I cannot... Dr. Saad, can, can, you, can you hear us? Yeah, because you have to mute your YouTube. Right now, you don't listen to me on YouTube. Just mute your YouTube and listen to me on WebEx. We can hear you, but I'm not sure if you are able to hear I, us. I cannot hear you. Um, let me see. Okay, try now. Yes, I can, I can hear you right now. Uh, sure, they would help, but the problem um, with uh, CFD on GPUs um, is that sometimes they're more costly, actually, because of the large number of systems of equations you might have to solve. And to so, for example, to solve for the pressure, um, this is going to get a little bit technical. Um, so any type of time-dependent transport agent, you can solve on the GPU very fast, faster than you would do on a CPU. The problem is when you get to systems of equations that you have to solve simultaneously. We do not have efficient solvers for those systems of equations, efficient linear solvers on the GPU beyond maybe 100 GPUs. When you're talking about 1,000 or 18,000 or 100,000 GPUs, which is the scale that you need to do some work like this, they, we, there's no, we don't know what to, how to solve those systems. Um, and so there are no available solvers. And so they become, actually, we have evidence that um, we will scale well um, if we run on the GPU. Because what happens then, what, how do you do these linear systems of equations? You move the data back to the CPU, solve the system of equations on the CPU where we have very efficient solvers, and then move the data back to the GPU and continue the simulation. And that data transfer is extremely expensive, so it kills your scalability. So it is an open-ended question, and I'm, I'm glad you thought of that. So a very good question. For simulation uh, to conduct such uh, study, uh yes yeah good good question so this is um like i mentioned um in the talk this is a our in-house code so 
I started developing this code um, in 2010 in collaboration with James Sutherland, um, and we continue developing it. So this is a local code. Um, any commercial code, maybe Flow 3D, Fluent, etc., they are not going to scale as far as I recently know, to the best of my knowledge, they don't scale beyond like 32 or 64, maybe 128 cores. Um, when you talk about serious scientific calculations, you need to have control over the parallelization, over the code that you're doing yourself. The challenge there is, you know, is a trade-off with um, Flow 3D or Fluent, Open, well, actually Open 4 is a different story. Um, with Flow 3D, these commercial software, um, you get a lot of physics models and you can do all sorts of things, do, you know, melting and fluid structure interaction, et cetera, but you lose the ability to do scaling because they're trying to target a large, uh, um, a large number of people, okay, or a large industry. However, when you want to do the scaling and the speed and all of that, you have to design your own code, okay? Thank you. Uh, just because uh, I have a full class that I'm teaching, uh, <laughs> open form guys, uh, it's fine. Open form is uh, a different story. It's still open source, no black boxes. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, but it is still acceptable in parallel scaling. Uh, abso absolutely, yeah. We 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 even considered adopting open form in my group as we move forward, um, uh, but uh, still have the greatest control over. You know, so our code is fully structured, and that's why we can reach extreme parallelism. So we can beat any unstructured code, code because of the way we lay things out in memory, etc. Um, but OpenFoam is um, one of the best open source codes you can get out there, um, and if you learn how to use it, it's gonna it's gonna take you um, uh, to longer distances because you will have control, you'll understand what the code is, what it's doing, you'll have control over putting in your own models. So as far as we know, it is as good a research code as any, uh, you know, it's it's designed by, you know, at a university. So that's great. Thank that you, Dr. Saad. Now, now they can focus on their, uh, on their projects. <laughs> okay, so do we have any other questions? Yes, yeah, I have. A, yes, yes, doctor. Go ahead. Good evening, Dr. Saad. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for this awesome presentation, but I have a question uh, related to the opening of the doors. Yeah. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we know that uh, the doors should remain closed uh, while performing. Don't you think uh, we can replace the opening of, uh, of doors by any uh, sucking air machines in order to maintain the quality of acoustics? Well, okay, so that was that that was something that we thought of and that they thought of. Any machine that they tried to access, so first you need to, where do you, where, where do you vent it out? I guess you might connect it to the return vents as well, but they're noisy. Those are noisy because of the fans that are in them. And so if you put very small size, very small size kind of suction devices, you still have to duck them through, okay? And that's potentially an option, um, but you got to make sure that they're not noisy. But typically, those are noisy. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what exists out there in terms of these kind of suction machines. Um, but most, more importantly, this is going to be more cost effective for the symphony to just open the doors and move around than having to build, um, to buy or purchase a bunch of these you know, suction devices and place them kind of in awkward spots. And you got to always make sure you're playing into the return. We also consider barriers and all of those things. Those are going to affect acoustics. Those are going to be costly. They're going to be cumbersome. So um, of all within the constraint we had, this was an elegant solution. So let me put it this way. It's not the only solution. You know, if if you were commissioned to do the work, you might come up with, a, with another solution that is as elegant, right? And so, but this is one solution given the constraints we had. So I'm not saying yes or no, we haven't considered that option, but seriously, but when we, you know, when we were throwing around ideas, um, it came up, um, there was some resistance against it because of noise and how cumbersome it's gonna be and you gotta make sure you're playing into it. It, um, yeah, it didn't gain momentum <laughs> to say the least, so. 
Thank you, Rawad. Uh, I think we still have time for one more question. Uh, Brahim? Uh, hello, Doctor. Uh, I wanted also to ask uh, in my first question after the CPU and GPU bound question, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, could mechanical engineers with the CFD background help epidemiologists to better predict how the coronavirus spreads or any future virus, a virus that sp uh, spreads through particulates? Uh, uh, so I really like your question, like? Brahim. I, um, so I'm going to start with a story. Uh, I, I like to talk a lot. I like to tell stories. So I'm going to bore you with this story. So in, in 2002, 2003, I was taking a CFD class at Notre Dame University with Professor Michel Hayek. And we had a guy come from Fluent um, give us a lecture about CFD. And I, I was always kind of passionate about programming and writing code for, you know, engineering applications. And any problem we'd have in the class, I would go write code about it. I used to use Visual Basic and, um, you know, Fortran at the time. And because, you know, that was a passion for me. So I, 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 I raised my hand and I asked the, the teacher, uh, the, the guy who came from Fluent, and I asked him, can a mechanical engineer be a CFD developer? So I, I'm relating this to your question. Can a mechanical engineer help epidemiologist? And, and the guy said, no, no, you, this is not your job. Your job is not to write CFD code. Um, um, uh, your job is to write, um, uh, is to do your engineering. And boy, he was wrong. So my entire life, I was trying to prove him wrong. And uh, in reality, he is actually wrong because I actually went to Fluent and all of the developers are mechanical engineers, all of them, nearly the vast majority of them. There's some chemical, some you know combustion folks, but the vast majority are mechanical engineers. So um, uh, uh, yes, um, we, we want to help epidemiologists. The problem is that um, they don't know we exist. And that's the problem that we faced with early on when we were, um, when we were reaching out to others at the university, explaining, uh, you know, and other departments, telling them, hey, we can help you doing this. They would come and like, no, uh, only we, only an epidemiologist can help us. And even in the um, School of Health. Um, and then, you know, it took some time to show them that, you know, we can help you. You can tell us about the dose response model, for example, but tell you how much dose, excuse me, is going to be delivered to an individual for example. And so it's going to take time. This pandemic, thankfully, is um, helping break that br barrier between the health folks and folks and the engineers. Um, if, if, and I'm in this position now, and if I were you, I would be, you know, always trying to mend these bridges together, say, look, you know, I'd be really interested. That's how we reach out to colleagues in health. Um, yay, look, you know, we would be interested if you could help us model infection risk. We have this data that does, you know, fluid transport, et cetera. From their perspective, they, they you know, don't, don't appreciate the science that goes into our engineering analysis. Um, but once they get into the details, they recognize how powerful what we're providing them with. Um, and so um, the way I say it, at, uh, so, so one, one guy told me, any analysis that doesn't include an epidemiologist is not a serious, and I'm not, I'm not going to consider. So I responded to him. I told him, in, in fact, any analysis that doesn't include fluid flow uh, simulation is not serious, a serious analysis to me. And, you know, I hope this work actually proves this. Good question, though. Thanks, Brahim. Thank you, thank you Brahim, uh, again. And thank, thank you, Dr. Tony. We have two more questions. The first one from John El Khoury. Uh, his question is, there any other solution that came to mind after the work was done? So John is taking us back into any minor <laughs> tweaks or quick fixes? Um, you know, uh, yes, there were many. Um, so, sorry, sorry, just allow me to interrupt for a second. Yeah, uh, right. Students registered in the course, if you need to leave uh, for iftar, no problem. Okay, sorry, Dr. Tony, for interrupting. Oh, that's okay. So, um, thank, you. There were, thank you. There were so many options that we considered. I, I don't remember um, 
uh, everything um, about it. But again, it's not the only solution. Now, what as as researchers, what we care about is kind of what's the next step. What I care about is, for example, having a fast response model calculation that could come up with an arrangement for me that reduces, for example, accumulation and gradients. So this is where an artificial neural network might come in. You feed it a bunch of simulations and you tell it, find an optimum arrangement for me that reduces, you put some constraints, reduces, for example, um, the, um, so you can combine this with respira respiration rates, 14 liters per minute, for example, and you could target a respiratory dose of a certain number, for example, run this through machine learning. Um, so this is the things I consider as we move forward, because that will give you a more effective um, solution. What we did here is really kind of back of the envelope calculation using a very fancy envelope, which is computational fluid dynamics. But, you know, that's what an engineer might do. But as a, you know, as a, as a, a, a enlightened engineer, let me say, let me say that, or as researchers, engineers interested in research, you got to take this, you got to look at the deeper engineering science into this. So machine learning, how we can employ this to better um, find seating arrangements, for example, you can apply, apply this to clinics, emergency rooms or hospital wards, school buses, airplanes, whatever, um, you, models that could do the CFD faster, you know, things like that. There was another question from Jimmy, and I think I might have to bail as well. I do have a meeting that's uh, I'm like 30 minutes late to right now, but this is fun. Um, um, I, I, I think this is a more fun meeting than the other meeting. <laughs> We're so glad a, to hear this reaction. <laughs> a Jimmy had a question. Have you considered the impact of sound wave propagation on the motion of individual small droplets? That is a very expensive calculation, Jimmy. So we have not considered that. And... That is not going to be that. That is going to be that's not going to be a leading order effect. So if you haven't heard of this term, um, what we are interested here is the bulk motion, not what happens individually at the particle level. We don't care about that. It's a huge hole. It's like asking, you know, on a football stadium, you know, what happens if there was a uh, a football field? Let's say, what happens if the grass in one spot was, you know, plucked? It doesn't matter, right? In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. So same thing here, we were looking at the leading order effect. What you're talking about are higher order effects. They come in later. Now we could do this potentially, but it's very expensive. Um, analyzing sound wave propagation requires a fully compressible solver or a model of the acoustics, which are by definition, Sound waves, you know, you 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 change you you change a property in the airflow. It creates a a signal that is going to propagate at the speed of sound or other speeds, and you got to track that. That's a very sp fast wave. You got to capture that, so your time stepping becomes small, and your coupling becomes more stiff between the energy equation and the properties of the the thermodynamic properties of the flow. The cost of doing that is not worth the benefit you get out of this. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Saad. Uh, we've been really honored with your talk today. And as expected, it was uh, extremely motivational. Thank uh, you very this much. being said, um, thank you for your presence. Thank you for all the participants who joined, especially those who are still here uh, after iftar time. And just to keep you posted, uh, some very quick notes from ASME. Uh, we are planning a Python workshop, so uh, uh, be tuned because the, we'll send you the, the invitations uh, soon. It will be between semesters, and we are also planning our um, our uh, elections uh, very soon as well. And to end up uh, today's talk, I want to thank Mike and the engineering seminar. So thank you so much, Mike, for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCall. Thank you, Dr. Tony. And thanks to ASME for organizing this uh, seminar. And hopefully uh, we'll be collaborating in future events soon. Of course. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.